A lot of familiar faces and some new faces, some former students, current students, faculty friends, friends from the community. Uh, and this is uh, hopefully a, uh, you'll find this to be an interesting and fun project that I did. And I'm going to get this moving the right way here. Hold on. Ah, there we go. Okay, there's the book cover. Um, as Nick said, uh, I, I, I published this book last year. And it came out uh, with the University of Washington Press. And um, it's a great privilege to be here tonight along with the beginnings of this Western Lands and Peoples Initiative. And so I just wanted to add my uh, encouragement to all of you to come and uh, take part in future lectures uh, in October and November and I think into December. So anyway, hopefully I'm a good lead off batter anyway to what, what I think is going to be a great series. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to have this tendency to probably want to walk away from that microphone. Can you still all hear me? Yeah. Is that good? Okay. Uh, but if, if I start you know, going downhill, let me know. Uh, what I want to do tonight is uh, 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 sort of accomplish three things. First of all, tell you a little bit about imagining and, and, and assembling this field guide to the American West, which was probably, for me anyway, the most ambitious book I've done to date, and give you a sense of some of the examples of key topics that I ended up covering in the book. Obviously, it's a huge topic, a field guide to the West. And then maybe close up the evening with talking about some of the character of the West today, uh, what I've learned, I guess, a little bit after wandering around the West for a lot of years. I do want to thank the University of Washington Press. They were the publisher of the book. And I'll talk a little bit about how they helped me put it together. And also, the Weyerhaeuser Foundation was very supportive in putting together the graphics for the book, the maps, the photographs, and so forth. Uh, Bill Cronin, uh, who, uh, who Nick quoted, uh, was the series editor for this whole Weyerhaeuser environmental book series and uh, did a fabulous job. Um, and of course, my friends and uh, employ employers here at Montana State University. University. Uh, one, of the, one of the really productive periods of time in terms of putting the book together was a sabbatical year that I had, 2012-2013. So anyway, that was much appreciated as well. This is, by the way, this picture in the background is St. Elmo, Colorado. Uh, it's got a population of about 10, uh, but it's a, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a nice picture that kind of gra grabs the New West and the Old West there. And we'll be talking about some of that, I guess, uh, this evening. Um, I'm a geographer. Uh, I'm not an historian or a sociologist or a biologist or ecologist. I'm a geographer. And uh, we play, I think, a lot of roles in a community, in an academic community, in a broader community. And certainly, we're engaged in academic research. And I've done a lot of that over the years. And I've done a lot of university teaching. Uh, this, by the way, is a one-room schoolhouse uh, out west of Haver, Montana. And I did take all the pictures that you're going to see tonight. So you can ask me about them if, they, if, if questions come up and so forth. Geographers also solve problems. And uh, we plan things. We plan transportation systems and cities and, and address lots of those kinds of practical things. I think really this book is more of an example of a geographer, hopefully, reaching out to a broader public. Uh, and trying to put together a set of ideas visually that really communicate with a broader public. And so one of the fun things about this project is that I've talked to Rotary Clubs, I've talked to uh, public libraries, I've talked to academic departments, uh, you know, I've talked at book fairs and bookstores and uh, in, in, in a lot of different kinds of audiences. And hopefully, uh, the geographer, one of the hats that we, that we can wear is reaching out to a broader public and talking about uh, what makes us tick and what makes regions tick, like the American West. Um, OK, so what was I trying to do in this book? What was I trying to do in this book? Uh, and you'll get the idea pretty quickly. I was trying to really imagine putting together a field guide of everyday Western landscapes. Not just, uh, and, and these are great too, but, and this picture is in the book, in fact, that's in Madison Valley. You may recognize it, right? Uh, not just physical features, but also why this IHOP in Santa Fe, New Mexico looks different than our, our IHOP, right, on North 19th. And that everyday Western American landscape is something that really uh, intrigues me. Places like uh, agricultural fields. Uh, this is in uh, strawberry pickers in the Salinas Valley. Or uh, the commercial strip, East Colfax Avenue in Denver, right? Uh, everyday places that often we don't even think about when we navigate to work or, you know, going uh, going here and there in town, right? Uh, so those are the kinds of places I was really interested in looking at. So you might ask, well, that's sort of a fun idea, but why would you devote 
four and a half or five years of your academic life to putting together this guidebook. And I think there are really three reasons that, that come to mind. One of them, and many of you might recognize this spot, this is down uh, south of Missoula, up the Bitterroot Valley, uh, looking at uh, a nice transect to the west there. But as a geographer, I would argue that that landscape right there, that scene where you see a little bit of sort of traditional agriculture here in the foreground, and a lot of those folks in the middle ground that are probably, they probably work in Missoula, but they love the view shed, right? And they've moved in here. And then the, the public lands in the background uh, and recreation opportunities and so forth. That cultural landscape for geographers, we, we argue, is very evocative. It's very representative of um, how a people get to uh, get to live in an environment, how they come to understand it, the kind of history that they make there. So I think one reason that motivated me for writing the book was that landscapes can tell us a lot about who we are and where we came from and our values and how we, how we do relate to the environment and so forth. Some of the landscapes in the book are very formally designed. This is downtown Denver. It's part of that great civic center area that was laid out in the early 20th century uh, as a part of the City Beautiful movement, right? Very planned and, and very much uh, a part of uh, Denver's character today. But as I said earlier, the landscapes that I really like are landscapes like front yards, you know? And this one is in Lakewood, California. I like, the, I like this guy. I couldn't decide whether he liked cacti or grass, you know? So we sort of put in a little bit of each. But a little bit unusual, right? But it's pretty cool. And that is... That's the sort of thing that, it, that attracts my eye, anyway, as a cultural geographer. There's ordinary places, and our front yards are very evocative that way. A second reason why I wanted to write a book is that it gave me a good, uh, a good arena to write a, a different kind of regional geography of the West, if you will. Uh, this spot here is southeast of Salinas in the, the kind of the California coast range. Really, really beautiful part of the country. Very, very dry right now, unfortunately. Um, but it gave me an opportunity to write an, a, a, a sort of new portrait of the West. And there is a lot of tradition in the book, and Butte is certainly featured in the book. Uh, and I certainly try to appreciate sort of traditional Western American history and say quite a bit about Native Americans in the book and their long legacy in the pre-American West, if you will. But it's also, it's also a book about this. Uh, this is a little strip mall in Southern California, part of the Little India community, right? Large South Asian population that has migrated into Los Angeles now and is reshaping the West. So I wanted it to be a book not just about the traditional, you know, uh, Western landscapes, but also these newer Western landscapes. And I think that was uh, another opportunity that this afforded me. And then third, like, like you folks, uh, large lake probably, uh, I live here. Uh, and many of you recognize maybe this scene. This is on the road out toward Norris, uh, west of town, right? And you look out toward the tobacco roots there. But it's, it's our home, right? And it gave me, I think, motivation because I care about the place I've spent much of my life in, my kids have grown up in. And uh, it's changing a lot. You know, this is an interesting shot, actually, because it's right on the, one of the western cusps of Bozeman's uh, influence. And you, know, you can see in the foreground here these houses uh, mark, and very nice homes, mark a kind of subdivided landscape, right, on the edge of Bozeman. And out beyond, you have a more traditional agricultural and public lands landscape and so forth, right? Uh, but it's our home. And are we making sustainable choices when we design the Arizona waterfront here in beautiful Scottsdale, Arizona, right? Uh, very, very pleasant, but uh, can Arizona, can Southern Arizona, you know, afford to continue growing and, and continue uh, consuming the water that it does? Uh, we're doing a lot of things in very fragile places, right? This is a big subdivision on the east side of Las Cruces, New Mexico. And uh, again, those kinds of dramatic transformations are shaping uh, us right now in, in this particular part of the world, obviously. Wham Sutter, Wyoming, okay? An energy community, beautiful, down south, Wham, beautiful downtown Wham Sutter. Uh, and again, part of the energy uh, sector, right? Part of the resource economy in the West. What about these communities? Are we really designing them for permanence? Uh, and what happens when the boom turns to bust? You know, and so and that's a cyclical reality in the West, right? For for a long time. So uh, again, it's 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 our home. We care a lot about it. 
And that, I think, also motivated me to try to understand it better and try to understand change is inevitable and change is often beneficial and good, but it's, 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 it's best when it's carefully done, I think, too. So how do you tell this story in a book, right? I was faced with the challenge of how do you organize the animal, right? How do you put it together? Like every, everybody in here who's, who's uh, written a book, and certainly if, if, if you just read a book and think about it, you start with a blank computer screen. You know, you start with a yellow pad of paper, if you will, right? And you start fiddling and, and thinking about it. And so I thought, well, I, maybe I could do state by state, have a chapter on Arizona, have another chapter on, you know, uh, Montana and so forth. But there's a lot of states, and the book got really, really big when I started thinking about that. Uh, even worse, if you were to take all the big highways of the West, and the highways of the West are great, and that would be an interesting way to communicate to folks out on the road and so forth. But if you start adding up all the highways, it got to be, you know, a thousand page book. Uh, so I came up with a broad topical approach, and I think. Um, some of you, if you came in, have this little uh, green sheet here. And if you didn't, you can get, get one on the way out. But for better or for worse, I organized it. I came up with a creative number, 100, right? And I came up with 100 sort of topical features to organize the story. And there's nothing sacred about this list. I had a lot of fun developing it with colleagues and friends and students and so forth. There's nothing sacred about the list. You could obviously add things, and we could we can, uh, brainstorm about that as well. Uh, but I think it does provide kind of a varied sampling, anyway, of, of things that one encounters on the Western landscape, some of which you would traditionally expect to see on a list like this, right, like rodeos or something, but other things like maybe commercial strip malls that you might not think, uh, but they're certainly out there, aren't they? Uh, one of my features is grain elevators, obviously, you know, and, and it's one of the, one of the 100. So um, what I try to do is to take those 100 features and to try to kind of define each one briefly, describe it, talk about some of its history and evolution, talk about its geography, some of the regional variations that you might find with the feature. Uh, what kinds of cultural meaning, one of the features is ghost towns, all right? This is my, one of my favorites. This is Bannock, of course, right? Uh, Hotel Me down in southwest Montana. Uh, what kinds of meanings do we associate with ghost towns and so on? And then just some practical tips for looking at that feature in the field. You know, you're in a ghost town. Uh, you're in a mining town. You're in a ski town. What kinds of things do you, do you look at? You know, what's, what should you look at as a geographer in those settings. So really briefly, and I'm not going to go through all 100 features with you, uh, but, but I wanted to just to, just to uh, remind you of the chapter organization in the book. So the first chapter, the first big chapter in the book is kind of the natural fundament, the physical features out there, the skyscapes of the West, right, the cloudscapes of the West, some of the vegetation like sagebrush and conifers and uh, cacti and uh, uh, some of the geology of the West, uh, dry washes and gullies and those kinds of things. So that's what, how I get folks started. And then I had to have a chapter on farm and ranch in the West, right? Such a big, you know, uh, land use in, in uh, our part of the country. Uh, this is, uh, that last scene, by the way, was central Wyoming. Uh, and this, uh, as you can guess, maybe this is the Palouse country uh, out northeast of Walla Walla, uh, that classic kind of uh, wheat landscape. So in that chapter, you know, I cover dry farming, I cover uh, orchards, vineyards, farm worker settlements, uh, farm towns, a variety of different kinds of features in there. Uh, then I had to have a chapter on landscapes of extraction, right? And so I obviously cover uh, great things like uh, underground mining and, and mining towns, uh, logging, coal, oil and natural gas. You know, how do those things, uh, again, how do we understand those things on the modern landscape? Then came probably the most challenging, interesting, and fun chapter to write. And for lack of a more imaginative title, I gave it places of special cultural identity. Now, every place in the West arguably has a lot of special cultural identity, but these are places, like this is out of the section on uh, Hispano Plaza towns. This is San Luis, Colorado, in southern Colorado, that part of that northern New Mexico, southern Colorado setting. There are other, uh, certainly uh, Native Americans, Indian country is, is, is covered here, Latino communities, the Mormon country, uh, African American communities, mostly in the urban west, uh, and so forth, are all part of this chapter. 
And uh, again, that took a lot of interesting field work and trying to understand uh, a lot of different kinds of communities which make up what we are today. Then I had a chapter called Connections, all right? And, and you know, you think about the West, you think about Western trails, you think about narrow gauge railroads, you think about open highways, things like that, right? And so interstate landscapes too, right? So um, uh, how, many of you, how many of you have heard of the, uh, uh, the loneliest highway in America? All right, that's US 50, right, across, across Nevada. Well, this is, uh, this is abandoned US 50, all right? This is the old US 50. Uh, it's still paved, doesn't see much traffic. You can go as fast as you want, really. Uh, <laughs> but it's out west of Austin, Nevada. And again, it typifies part of our connection to the west via literally our connective fiber out there that we have on the landscape. Um, had ha I had to have a chapter on landscapes of federal largesse in the West, right? We all know how important <laughs> Uncle Sam is out here. This is uh, military base southern New Mexico, but also our national forests, national parks, BLM, wilderness areas. Also the legacy of atomic energy in the West, the legacy of the New Deal back in the 30s in the West. All those things uh, I try to capture in a brief way in this part of the book. Uh, very, very you know, foundational kind of definition of, of the West, certainly. Let me go back if I can here. Um, then the next to the last chapter in the book is cities and suburbs. It's kind of where most Westerners actually live, right? Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, and I remember my mother dragging me down to the LA Music Center, you know, back when it opened up. And that's what this is. It was part of a, an attempt to reimagine uh, a lot of Western American downtowns, right? And so cities and suburbs is the title of this chapter. And in here I talk about the City Beautiful movement, California bungalows, front yards, modernist apartment boxes, commercial strips, edge cities. Uh, I, I end the chapter with hillside letters, actually, which are on the edge of a lot of western towns, as we well know, right here in Montana. Um, so that was, uh, again, it took me to every metropolitan area, once again in the west, to, uh, to try to reacquaint myself with some of that. And then obviously the end of the book has to be playgrounds, right? Uh, because Westerners love to play and we play in the landscape and we reshape the landscape when we play. And so places like Copper Mountain, Colorado, right? Uh, obviously a four, you know, four season playground here. But we've got dude ranches and hot springs resorts and uh, hunting and fishing, rodeos, ski towns and all the rest. So that seemed to me to be an essential part of the story, at least in the 21st century West, right? So doing the field work uh, took me uh, about five years or so. I still remember taking that first picture in March 2008 with the project in mind. Anyway, I've been taking pictures ever since I was a kid, I guess. But uh, to, on the edge of Denver, I took the last picture a couple of uh, summers ago in August of 2013 in St. George, Utah, actually. I did uh, revisit or visit all 11 western states, put over 30,000 miles on the car or cars, um, in multiple, multiple trips just for this project. I did visit all the major metropolitan areas in the West and I did finish, it's one of those silly little things that geographers do, but I finished visits to every county in the West, all right? Uh, but I, I wanted to have a sense at least that I, I sort of knew it, at least I'm not an expert on every county, believe me, but uh, I did want to at least see every county, you know? And that was an important part of just the experience for me as a, uh, as a geographer. So, let me, there are about 420 images in the book. As I said earlier, I took them all. There are some historical images. This one, by the way, you may recognize. This is at Manzanar, a Japanese internment camp in the Owens Valley, south of Bishop, California. Uh, I had about 30 maps and diagrams drafted for the book. And like I say, I tried to write in an accessible writing style. And this is where it was really a, a, a cool experience to work with the University of Washington Press. I did not, the, the way this book was written, um, I wrote it by individual page spreads. So, in other words, I just didn't hand a bunch of text to the press and a bunch of photographs and say, take care of this, please, make it into a book kind of thing. What I did was try to design every page. So hopefully it would effectively teach a visual lesson as you kind of turn the pages, look, compare photos, that sort of thing. So in, in that sense, it was, in my experience, moving a little bit away from a pure text format toward more images, integrating captions, maps, diagrams, 
and juxtaposing ideas for readers visually. Let me give you just really two quick examples. And the press was so good to work with this way. Uh, this uh, is a picture I showed you earlier. And this is another picture of kind of an edge of town sort of development near Boise, Idaho. And again, it's great to have these two pictures on the same page spread in the book because then you can connect with your readers about different ways to organize open space on the edge of a city, right? And you can sort of plop houses down in the midst of open space, or you can concentrate your open space here, concentrate your houses here, right? And just to do that visually, it's, it's a concept we're all familiar with probably, especially if you're into the planning literature and into, in, into how the edge of towns look and so forth, but it's nice to do it visually. Um, this was another kind of fun pair I had. This was um, some of the old mining housing in Leadville, Colorado, the two mile high city, right? Old mining town. And uh, a lot of these houses have been gentrified, have been fixed up and are quite nice. And I, so I put that on the same page spread with the uh, mass produced company housing in Baghdad, Arizona, which is a copper company town basically, right? And so a lot of this housing was built about 100 years after that housing. But it's just a little reminder about the, the need for labor, the need for housing in mining towns, and some of the continuities in that. So I kind of tried to line up the shots the same way and, and just sort of think visually, you know, as a, as a photographer, I guess, and as a geographer. Um, okay, so um, this, by the way, this, by the way, is one of the funnest things about Coalinga, California. All right, uh, and if you've ever been to Coalinga, you know what I'm saying. Uh, it's kind of out in the. It's very rich in, in in petroleum, and it's in the central California, central valley of California. It was about 107 when I took this picture, right? And it's uh, it gets pretty baked and hot uh, much of the year. But anyway, this is an example of the Iron Zoo, which was built there. Um, these little paintings were added on by, uh, by an individual back in the 1970s. So a lot of the little pump rigs have, uh, have these fanciful animals and dinosaurs and so forth. It's kind of cool. So what are some of the more general things that I learned about the West, I guess? And I came up with a list of six that I want to kind of walk through you with you and, and some examples and so forth. First has to do with demography and population. I started, I started wandering around the West in a way that I remember back in the early 1970s. That's quite a while ago in one way. And the West, if you look at the population of the Western states, including California, in the early 70s, it was about 33 million. Now we're looking at a region uh, within a generation, obviously, that has more than doubled, all right, since, since a lot of us have been wandering around the West. That's a lot of population growth. This is, is the first maybe obvious thing I would say to you. The other thing as a geographer that I would say to you is that that population growth has been incredibly uh, selective. It's been very uneven, right? There's not an even spread, right, of this growth, but it's very, very uneven. And so looking toward the next 25 to 50 years in the West, out toward mid-century and beyond, you can already see where some of these population zones are going to continue to rapidly transform the Western landscape. Uh, in settings like this, uh, like metropolitan fringes, this is right on the edge of Fort Collins in Colorado, and it, it, it is a nice visual shot of a fringe because these patio homes went in here right opposite an, a, a planned open space. If you can imagine, the Rockies are sort of out there, right? And these folks are all have their view lots. But these are the accessible, uh, they're, uh, they, they have high amenities, view sheds and so forth. These places are locked and loaded pretty much to grow for the rest of our lifetimes, I think. Uh, there'll be cyclical booms and busts and, and we all know that. But overall, these are gonna be high amenity environments. Then you work down the, the hierarchy to the smaller centers, to what we call the micropolitan centers of the West. There's that shot I got of St. George, Utah, right? And standing on a hill looking at all that, much of it amenity, retirement-driven growth uh, that has reshaped that southern Utah town. And uh, Kalispell, ben, Kalispell, Montana, Bend, Oregon, Bozeman in some ways are certainly examples, right? of these high, uh, high quality, high growth areas that are attracting a lot of folks for, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, on down the hierarchy, even in many areas of the West, and there was a really good report, in fact, that just came out in the last few weeks uh, by Headwaters Economics here in town, about a lot of the rural uh, housing growth in the greater Yellowstone area and over into nearby areas of Idaho. This happens to be in Colorado. This is around the, uh, the Dillon uh, area of central Colorado. 
but just where you have lots of folks that enjoy the amenities of an area. There's no real town there, but there's just a lot of often very, very high-end homes, right? Uh, and people enjoy the hiking, the skiing, and four-season uh, kinds of activity. And then there are the Wham Sutters, too, which are going to boom and bust in the future, but are going to continue to be shaping, uh, periodically anyway, cyclically, right, depending on the price of metals and oils and natural gas and so on, these selected resource zones are going to continue to be part of our fabric, I think, in the West uh, in terms of population growth in, in our lifetimes. So population is part of, of, of certainly the equation. Um, a second thing that, that is, is obvious, but I, I think I have some nice illustrations of it, and that is that nature's dynamic and unpredictability is so legible in the West. I mean, nature is unpredictable everywhere on the planet, right? But it's so legible in the West. It's so visible in the West. And the landscape is such an evocative messenger about nature's uh, uh, changes and cyclicity and unpredictability. This is obviously the kind of the textbook shot from a California reservoir. This is Shasta Lake. I'm sure it's even lower this year. But uh, again, just the, just the tail of water in the West is, so, is something that fascinated me as I visited every corner of it. So, so many of the landscapes of the West reflected the, the challenges of, of managing the flow of water, right? Sometimes too much. I mean, we always get a kick out of driving through the desert, right, and seeing the flash flood signs. Unfortunately, you know, just a few days ago, right, in southern uh, uh, Utah, northern Arizona, you had a textbook example of, of uh, how fast the, the, uh, you know, the, the stream flows and the weather can change in those kinds of settings, a tragic example. Uh, this shot here is right uh, near oh, uh, Redlands, California, out uh, eastern side of southern California. And again, the, the challenges of managing runoff from the San Bernardinos as well as managing water storage for nearby suburbs. We're always managing water so visibly in the West. So everywhere I went, I tried to take shots and think about how, you know, how that really defines so many of our experiences in, in everyday lives in the West. This shot here is taken from uh, southern New Mexico along the Rio Grande, and this shot here is uh, out northeast of Idaho Falls. But just how much of our landscape is devoted to managing what is a precious resource, certainly in the West. Uh, let me go back to that one. Uh, vegetation, all right? Western vegetation is another, such a great indicator of the interplay, really, of people and uh, the natural environment. And uh, this is an example many of you will be familiar with. Uh, in the southwestern deserts, this is in the Navajo country, the tamarisk, the salt cedar that has invaded. It's not a natural plant in this part of the world. It was brought in, actually, originally from Asia, but it has you know, it has snuck into so many of these arroyos and gullies and often posed real problems, especially for the water table and so forth. But an example of, again, humans interacting with their environment in, in a subtle and unpredictable way, right? Um, that shot that I showed you earlier, that shot from California, again, it's interesting to, co to, to just comment and observe that probably 80 or 90 percent of those grasses are from Europe. You know, they're not native to that area, even though we think of that as a, as a native California landscape. So the vegetation oftentimes has interplayed with, with human, uh, human purpose human accident uh, to shape the landscape that we do see there. And of course, uh, the, uh, the pine beetle, right? Uh, in, infesting so many areas so visibly in the West. And if you travel through central Colorado, in the last well, five or 10 years, you know how whole, this is just south of Rocky Mountain National Park on the west side, and you can see whole ranges that have been uh, reworked uh, by our beetle friends. And again, some folks uh, attribute that to some global warming and some, some issues regarding to that. They, the, you know, the beetles have been around a long time, uh, but certainly that's a very, very visible landscape signature. I also encountered lots of fires around the West, some of them burning when I was traveling. Uh, we certainly had plenty of those in, in, uh, uh, in California and in the West this year. This one was just uh, north of um, San Luis Obispo in, uh, in that part of uh, sort of central California. And the role of wildfire in reworking the western landscape is again another big theme that I saw everywhere. Uh, from forest, this is the Lewis and Clark Forest out northwest of Shoto, uh, to the top of the Santa Catalina Mountains uh, in uh, uh, up above uh, Tucson uh, in, in that area. So fire is reworking the landscape, certainly. So lots of great opportunities to think about the interplay of people and nature, in other words, in the West. 
All right, uh, let me recalibrate uh, a little bit and say something about the cultural geography of the West in terms of things that really struck me. This is a great mural, by the way, off Central Avenue in Albuquerque. Um, but it was a reminder of how much of uh, the cultural geography of the West has changed, certainly in my lifetime, and wandering around various parts of it. Um, Latinization is a huge theme, right? The West is now, according to the census of 2010, 29% Latino. And uh, Latinos are in every Western state. They are reshaping the landscape in a profound way. LA County's Latino population is now bigger than Costa Rica, all right, the whole, whole country. So it's a transformative influence and it's reshaping the cultural geography of the West in all kinds of fascinating ways. Example A, um, this is a really neat little suburb that was built by Del Webb right after the Second World War. It was featured, in fact, on the cover of Life magazine. Uh, it was called Pueblo Gardens. It's on the south side of Tucson. And basically, it was advertised out to white, middle-class Midwesterners, right, who were wanting to get out to Tucson and so forth. And they occupied Pueblo Gardens for a generation or two. But today, it's a Latino barrio. It's gone through a Latin, Latino transformation. And uh, so all those old um, Dell Webb called them the little patio homes that were built in the late 1940s are transformed now into a Latino neighborhood. Uh, or, I like this sign, uh, talk about hybridized identity, right? Mi favorita market. Uh, and this is in Toppenish, Washington. Uh, and again, you get this great interplay of sort of the, the traditional mural up there up above, right, with the old blacksmith shop and the reality of farm labor in the Yakima Valley now, which is how a lot of people make a living and what they're interested in going to the store for and so forth. Uh, or this place, maybe you've been there in San Francisco, La Palma Mexicatessen, you know? What great hybridities we get when we, and signs are fun, you know? Signs are fun to look at, uh, but they suggest the underlying processes, don't they? They suggest the blending and they, and they suggest the, uh, the multiplying, if you will, of our, of our cultural identities in the West. Seattle, the International District of Seattle, right? And a diverse Asian transformation is, of course, shaping especially the coastal states, but in many other areas as well, Las Vegas, Denver, uh, and across the West. And uh, actually, when you look at the immigration statistics from 2000 versus 2010, there's a higher percentage now from diverse places in Asia of immigrants coming from that part of the world, even versus the Latino immigrants. Uh, and so you get all these interesting hybridities again. This is, uh, in my own neck of the woods, this is Monterey Park, California, which is probably one of the largest Chinese ethnoburbs. Uh, that's a geography term, okay? I didn't make it up. Uh, ethno burbs uh, in the United States, but it's got a huge and quite wealthy Chinese population. So what do you have here? You have kind of a 1970s style generic ap California apartment house that has been subtly transformed. And so you've got the, the Chinese lettering up on top there, you've got the mosaic, you've got the little columns, you've got the bamboo trees planted. So in many subtle ways, those, the, the, the Chinese there that are there, uh, and some of them have been there since the 1970s in this particular community, it's an old Chinese ethnoburb, uh, are making it their own. Sometimes it's not so subtle, okay? That's the largest Vietnamese shopping mall in our country, all right? That's in Southern California, in Orange County. Uh, and again, it's for a large Southeast Asian population that has uh, rooted itself in Southern California now very successfully uh, since the end, some of them since the end of the Vietnam War and so forth, right? So uh, again, a reminder about that cultural transformation. And I can say more about that later, but uh, uh, that's certainly one thing that I observed. Now I'm going to shift a little bit to an economic point, and that is uh, what I think you could call the corporatization of the Western landscape. When you look at the size of investment, literally, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the supersizing of the Western landscape because uh, uh, you know, you have so many large capital investments now, whether it's in mining. You want to run a successful mine now, and at, at, at $1,100 gold, even this is maybe losing money. But this is Newmont Mine, uh, uh, Carlin Mine. They give a great tour, by the way. But you have to do it at a big scale, right? So the scale of economies is promoting a bigness out there on the landscape. So if you want to grow some orange trees, industrial scale, right, on the east side of the San Joaquin Valley here. Uh, if you want to get into wind energy, this doesn't cut it anymore, right? Uh, this is the kind of economics of wind energy. That's in Tehachapi Pass. We've got plenty of examples here, right, in Montana. Uh, if you want to build a subdivision, like I told you on the east side of, of um uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, that's the scale. We're, we're, we're beginning in the last 
10 or 15 years to see something approaching this scale on the northwest side of Bozeman, aren't we? You know, that sort of, that sort of scale of uh, capital investment. Or uh, this is Breck, Breckenridge in Colorado, uh, where you have, uh, I remember going to Breckenridge as a little kid. It was a, you know, burnt out, dying mining town, right? And some of you maybe have had that memory or had that experience. But of course, it has, it has been discovered by global corporate capital, and, and you have what you have now. Um, just to give you one other quick visual example of, of the differences, uh, this is sort of a 50 style commercial strip. It still lives. It's in uh, uh, Holbrook, Arizona, actually. Uh, so that's the older style, and here's kind of the style of commercial strip that we're more used to now, right? The big signs, the big companies that are going to provide us with a predictable burger or, you know, fill up or what have you. Uh, I'm hung up on IHOP there, I guess, but I didn't mean to be. I just looked at that. Uh, but anyway, but you know, that's, that's the kind of direction that our economy has gone. And it's, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I just think it's something that, that I observe, certainly, as you think about what's happening out there in the landscape. Uh, the fifth thing that I would uh, observe is uh, evident in lots of different settings around the West. And I was driving in southeastern New Mexico on a hot July day, and I looked out. This is south of Hobbs, if you know where that area is. It's, it's West Texas, basically. And I looked out the window, and I saw that scene. I said, oh, that's interesting. I'll get out of the car. And I realized it was a huge metal sculpture that was spread across the landscape, right? And so uh, it, did, it didn't move much. Um, so, you know, and, and obviously it is commemorating the cowboy culture and the longhorns and so forth that are still an important part of that, that part of New Mexico. But it was a reminder to me how evocative, how rich the landscape is in terms terms of exploring our meanings and our values and the symbols that we have that we associate with our with our heritage here. And some of that, some of that is certainly physical landscape, things like wild animals. These are lawn ornaments you can buy in Darby, Montana. Uh, but also, you know, the how we covet our open space and our wild lands and our mountains and deserts, and also the kinds of cultural myths that we have, right, about frontier life and cowboy culture and taming the land and so on. So the symbolic power is something that was fun for me to explore. And this is, this is a, an obvious example that maybe many of you have seen, uh, but uh, you can stay in a teepee, right? Which is a sort of a regionally inappropriate uh, house in the Native American heritage. This is in, in Holbrook, Arizona. It doesn't really fit there. And uh, to, add, to add the kicker of the old cars, right? Because this is uh, US, old US 66. So a lot of folks like to travel along and spend the night in the teepee. But those kinds of symbolic images is, uh, you know, we place a lot of enjoyment in, we place a lot of value in and so forth. Uh, if you're going to go gamble south of Albuquerque, you might go into a casino that looks like that, right? That's, that's again, uh, Native American owned and it's stylized, obviously, picking up elements of color and design from the Pueblo culture. Unfortunately, when you get inside, the slot machines are just the same. They're just as dull and just as, you know, much of, at least for me, a loser. But uh, again, the exterior here is interesting and quite attractive, actually. Um, if you're going to go buy some real estate, right? A lot of you guys have seen this, I know. In Kellogg, Idaho, it's right off of Interstate 90, right? Uh, and you're driving along off to the right there, off to the north. And the old miner's hat realty is there to sell you real estate, commemorating the silver mining, the underground mining in that area. So we use our landscapes to engage you know, with Western identity and Western culture and so forth. Uh, if you're going to go have a cocktail in Breckenridge, uh, you might go to the Dredge restaurant. All right? And this, again, is an old part of uh, mining technology in uh, many of the college. Well, we've done a lot of dredging here in Montana as well. So again, we pick those things up visually. And art towns are great places to go. Uh, this is out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. You know, and you've got all these great uh, symbols there, right? Our, our skulls and our dried peppers and sun gods and so forth. But our towns are great places. This is Tubac, Arizona, south of Tucson. Uh, and again, they're having their annual art festival. And again, look at that wall. It's just covered with those great symbols of place and identity. And they're out there on the landscape. And, and they can be read and enjoyed, not just by, I mean, the point of the book is not just by me, but hopefully by all of us, you know, as we, as we think about these kinds of settings. Uh, or examine public art. This was down a little alleyway. I found it in Superior, Arizona, an old copper mining town. You know, a celebration there of the miners and also the Latino uh, tradition uh, and mining population and uh, current population in Superior, Arizona. So public art is great to examine as well. 
Okay, last but not least uh, is that landscapes are a great window into time, into how time passes in a place. And this is a place where a lot of you probably, if you've been there, certainly you remember it. It's Monument Valley, right, on that Arizona-Nevada border. And again, when you start to think about geological time, uh, this is a, along a trail in Zion National Park, uh, landscapes are traditionally thought of as, yes, you can read the layers of the rock and, and see the Mesozoic rocks and so on. And that's an important part of our understanding. But I would say as a cultural geographer, uh, the built landscape can also tell stories about how time has passed in a place. So, uh, in fact, this is the illustration that I start the book with. It's in a western New Mexico town called Magdalena, uh, New Mexico. And this old bank here was built a little over 100 years ago, uh, around 1905-1906. And it, it thrived in Magdalena until 1931. And then, like a lot of banks in the West, it went belly up, right? But it wasn't tore down. And so what happened is a, a little restaurant came in, a little fountain came in. In fact, if you go in the back, you can still see the old ice cream freezers in the back laying piled up in the back. But for many years, it became a little town a little town, a cafe, uh, they served ice cream, they had a fountain, and then it went out of business too. And now, more recently, I met the lady that runs this place, it's called the Village Press Print Studio, and she does classes, she does specialty printing and so forth, but I guess the point is pretty obvious, right? The built landscape can also tell stories about how time has passed in a place and what has happened there. It doesn't tell the whole story, but it can get you thinking, you know, it can get you thinking about how that unfolds in a locality. Farmsteads are another great setting for this sort of thing, and we know this from Montana. This is eastern Colorado. This is out near the Kansas border. But farmsteads are great accumulations, right, of often several generations, especially if you're from a farm family and you see various things from different eras, uh, from maybe a pioneer era and outbuildings to something that was added later, right? So you can really read a landscape in terms of an accumulation of memories and of people and of the objects, right, that oftentimes on a farm, they don't get carted away. They just get kind of accumulated, right? And so that is another uh, enjoyable way to, you know, to, to think about time and landscape. Also, a lot of clues of abandonment around the West. Uh, this is out back of my motel in Klamath Falls, Oregon. And I'm on the jogging trail here, right? And uh, I realize that I'm on an old narrow gauge railroad line, right? Which the, uh, the Rails to Trails program is is ubiquitous around the West. And again, a reminder that the landscape can often give you a clue about the past in a subtle way. Um, this is the other way around, in a sense. This is clues of tomorrow's landscape. This has got to be one of the West's most optimistic city halls. Okay? <laughs> it is. It's a city hall. Uh, it's the city hall for Rio Rancho, New Mexico, which is a planned community out northwest of Albuquerque. And Rio Rancho is is growing, uh, you know, I'm, I can tell you, to, the, to my left here, but they've planned the city hall uh, to be eventually, obviously, surrounded by more uh, suburbanization and commercial buildings and so forth. So it was kind of a nice little example, right, of reading time into a landscape, some of that Western optimism coming into play there, certainly. Uh, okay, so I, I'm getting the end of my, my talk tonight, but I do I want to do a couple more things. I want to give you my top five images, for better or for worse, and I'll walk through these. And then I'm going to do a very, very brief reading about the open road in the West, okay? So here's number five on my list. And this is Ritzville, Washington, first of all, okay? Uh, and, and I put it in here for a couple reasons. First of all, it's not the Ritzville that most of you know, which is probably the Starbucks, the McDonald's. It's on Interstate 90 on the way out to Seattle. So if you drive out that way, you stop in Ritzville, right? You get a fill up of caffeine and, and burgers and gas. But this is the original Ritzville, or the older Ritzville, which is an old farm town, which is struggling now. And so many of the small towns, that I encountered are struggling in the West. Uh, and that extends through eastern Colorado, eastern Washington. Obviously, they've lost a lot of their population. We've mechanized, but a lot of those towns are struggling. Uh, and again, Ritzville has a lot of character, the downtown area. It's got some of the great old buildings and so forth. And one thing I really liked, and it might be hard to read from the back, but I like this business combination over here, the quilt shop liquor store, OK? <laughs> kind of a combination you know, of, of creative forces there. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, you know, seriously, I mean, Ritzville is, is a type of a very common kind of experience around the West, right? Um, this is an experience that you've all had, right? You're sitting in your car, you come around the corner, and there, uh, there are the sheep ahead of you, or the cattle, or maybe the bison in Yellowstone, right? But I put this in. It's in Utah. It's near Gunnison, Utah, on US 89, that great road down through Utah. And I put it in. 
because it was so accidental, because it was so serendipitous. And the photo came out pretty well. I got the herder there, the dead tree, the sheep, the pickup, the mountains in the background, and I just took it through the windshield. You know, it's just one of those kinds of things, right? I didn't plan for the right light for an hour and a half or anything else. But it, it just reminds you how much of the, the special memories that we have in life are serendipitous, are unplanned, right? And that's a part of how we remember and value landscape. Uh, number three, or number two rather, uh, was, here, did I miss number three? Yeah, well, let's not miss number three. Uh, Koreatown. That's my old home area, Los Angeles. I put it in here. I just love the juxtaposition of language on that sign, you know? Uh, but it's a reminder of the cultural richness of California, Southern California, especially more urban uh, Southern California. That's uh, just west of the LA, kind of the downtown LA area. Number two, I had to put something in for Las Vegas, right? And I, I didn't know what to do with Las Vegas in my list. You may have noticed, I simply made it number 100. I didn't know what else to do with it, right? It's its own feature. What do you do with Las Vegas? Because it's everything from Egypt to New York, New York to everything else, right? Uh, but it is a fantasy landscape. It's, it was too big to just call it a commercial strip. It's, you know, commercial strip on steroids. But uh, anyway, if you have a camera and you're interested in landscape, Las Vegas is a great place to wander around, right? And uh, this was obviously the Luxor. All right, now we're to number one, and I just want to lower expectations, first of all, because, and a couple of you, if you've seen this talk before, bear with me, but it's not going to be Golden Gate Bridge or Yosemite Falls or, you know, Yellowstone uh, Canyon or something, but it is the all-exciting oil tank farm east of Casper, right? And so that's in there too for a reason and uh, let me, it, it goes with the story and a lot of the landscapes we remember have a memory for us, not because they're Yellowstone Falls, but because of something that happened to us personally there, right? Or with our kids or our wives and girlfriends and boyfriends and so forth. So uh, this, uh, I took this picture on a public highway, all right, just to set the scene, bright sunny day, and somebody at the plant thought that I was acting suspiciously, okay? That's what I hear. And so rather than coming over and saying, you know, sir, what are you doing? And, and, uh, uh, and so forth, uh, he called, he took down my license plate, out of state plates, right, I'm Montanan, and then called the police, all right? And said, I think we've got an industrial terrorist out there, all right? That was the, that was the term I heard later associated with myself. So I didn't know anything about this. And so uh, I go, you know, blindly driving on, and uh, the sheriff had my, uh, you know, had my, uh, uh, license material, so he, he phoned home, and my teenage son was there. Tom answers the phone, and this is Sheriff, you know, who done it from Wyoming. Uh, we're, we're interested in your father. Uh, he's been acting suspiciously here in Wyoming. <laughs> yeah, that's what they. And so, and so uh, he said, "What exactly does your father do for a living?" And he, Tom said, "Well, he's a cultural geographer." Well, that really probably set the sheriff off. He did probably <laughs> wouldn't know what that was. It sounds suspicious right away, right? So I'm getting in hotter and hotter water. So the, the sheriff issues a bulletin for me, right? So for people to be on the watch, law enforcement and so forth, be on the watch for this guy. He's from Montana, acting suspiciously, taking pictures. So anyway, uh, I, the next place I go is Fort Laramie, Wyoming. That's my next, next target, if you will, right? So I'm going through, and the, the, and the, and the entrance uh, ranger kind of looks at me really weird. I I was very aware that the ranger was looking in the back seat and look, trying to look under. And, you know, the ranger had been alerted, apparently, right? And so I went ahead and took my strategic shots of Fort Laramie. And then about an hour later, I finally got a phone call from the sheriff. He, he tracked down my cell phone number. And he called me. I was in Torrington. Uh, and he called me. And he said, this is sheriff. And we, we've had numerous reports, <laughs> numerous. By now, I've gotten into numerous, numerous reports of you acting suspiciously. Uh, what are you doing? You know, and so I, you know, I was 100 miles plus by now away from the sheriff, so I was able to have a kind of, you know, liberating conversation. I said, well, isn't it a shame that in the United States of America, in the early 21st century, you can't stand on a public highway and take a picture anymore, right? And I was making my point about free whatever, but uh, he had a good point too, and he said, well, he said, you know, I'm, in, I'm responsible for protecting these, uh, uh, these installations, and lots of people could be killed, and so forth, and I understood that. So we had a nice meeting of the minds, uh, and by the end of it, finally, you know, he took me off America's Most Wanted, or the no-fly list, or anything. <laughs> but, uh, and I escaped Wyoming that afternoon safely, but. 
again, it was a reminder, first of all, you do have to be careful when you have a camera in your hands, uh, you know, on the landscape these days, right? And anytime you go onto private land, do get permission and so forth. Uh, but it also is a reminder about the special quality of personal stories and memories in the West. And I had many of them. Uh, every, every one of these pictures I've been showing you this evening comes along with, uh, with a memory and with a story, certainly. So what I try to do in the book, just to kind of move toward a wrap up here, is, is try to portray a lot of different kinds of West because it's a really diverse part of the country, right? Everything from uh, the boating and the skiing around uh, Dillon Reservoir uh, to the homeless folks in, in uh, Los Angeles. Huge homeless community, much bigger than when I was there as a kid. Uh, and I have one of my features, it's called City Invisible, and in, in looking at uh, shelters and homeless folks and, and all the things about cities that we kind of don't really look at very carefully. Um, so anyway, what I want to do really briefly, if you, if you bear with me, is just to read you, a, it's very short, uh, the, uh, the section, I guess I can come back to the microphone now, the section on the open road, uh, which begins, of course, with this little, this little photo from Nevada. Uh, for many Americans, the open road best captures the essential character of the West, unfinished, open-ended, a marriage of the human psyche with the earth, sky, and highway. The genius of the open road lies in its simplicity, reducing to a bare geometry of space and form all the possibilities that a full tank of gas can offer. The modern aesthetic of the open road, with its celebration of individualism and freedom, blossomed between 1915 and 1935, as Americans learned to love their automobiles and motorcycles. Open roads drew Jack Kerouac on his treks between San Fr uh, Denver and San Francisco. They defined the blue highways that so delighted William Least Heat Moon in the West. The open road inspired Bobby Troop, who wrote Get Your Kicks on Route 66 in 1946. Also inspired Chevron Oil's 1950s See Your West campaign, as well as modern muralists uh, drawn to a seemingly endless linear landscape. And this is a reference to this picture, which I actually took in, in San Francisco, but it's on the side of a building. It was such a great celebration of that sort of freedom of, uh, of the open uh, road. Okay, last shot is from Montana, actually, coming into Fort Benton. Learn to appreciate the subtleties of the open road. Ponder the space it produces. An open road creates its own shapes, which shift with distance and time. The ribbon of highway is an invitation of dirt or asphalt defined by long stretches of straight road with an occasional angle or bend. There are variations on the surface, washboard, bits of gravel, painted lines, skid marks, roadkill. Embankments, shoulders, fences, utility poles, and signs sharpen its definition. The larger ambient environment shapes the experience, the topography, the vegetative mosaic, the isolated placement of human artifacts, the horizon, the color and clarity of sky and clouds. Open roads are often best encountered in solitude, defined by individual experiences and expectations. Some of the best open roads are in New Mexico, both eastern and western, in the Four Corners area, through Navajo and Hopi landscapes. Open roads also stretch through the Great Basin, especially in central Nevada, western Utah, and southeastern Oregon, as well as through California's coast ranges from Kayama north to Hollister. Finally, you can drive the open road through the prairies from Montana to the outback of southeastern Colorado. Just try to keep it under 80. So, thank you very much. <laughs>